So anyways, uh, with that kind of background, uh, let's uh, give a welcome to Kurt Keelish. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you again. Um, my topic is going to be on the Keystone Pipeline and the issues of eminent domain and how the two relate. But in order to do that, we need to get a background. I think when I speak to a lot of people about Keystone, they don't really have the background, nor do they really understand what this pipeline is. Just to give you a little background, uh, the bill's progress, as it was just stated, has passed both the Senate and the House. Um, and he is correct, it's bill uh, in the House, H.R. 3, and it's S. 1 for the Senate. It passed overwhelmingly on both, and of course the President has already made it crystal clear that he is going to veto this. Now, I ho ask you to hold your opinion on the President until after the end of the presentation. Here's what they approved. They approved that it authorizes the Trans-Canada Keystone Pipeline, LP, to construct, connect, operate, and maintain the pipeline and cross-border facilities specified in the application of which they had already submitted way back in 2012. Essentially, what they have done is they have said, TransCanada has the right of eminent domain. We agree with that. Therefore, it's to the greater good of the public. They are allowed to construct the pipeline. And why does it need an act of Congress? Well, it needs an act of Congress in this case because of the very fact you have a foreign entity coming into the United States. If it wasn't a foreign entity, then you would be dealing with FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Co uh, Commission, or the states themselves. But because of a foreign company coming across the border, this also needed to go to the Congressional Act. Well, what is the keystone? I was asked very early, what does XL mean? means extra big, extra large. I'm not joking. That's exactly what it means. Um, what you might not know is there's already a Keystone Pipeline. This is the second one. There's already one. It's smaller. That's why they had to differentiate this one. XL, extra large. And of course, Gilbert Brown pretty much fills that void. It's by TransCanada. It's a foreign company. It's based in, obviously, Alberta, Canada. And this I mean, this project is going from Alberta, Canada to the Gulf Coast. It's now an $8 billion project. I had to make that correction because I gave this presentation last year to the National Eminent Domain Conference, and then it was only $7 billion, so it's gone up by a billion bucks already. Let's look at what this line is. It's 1,659 miles long, basically from tip to tip, tip to top. If you see here, it starts up in Hardisky right up there, and travels all the way down to Port Arthur and Houston. And of course it splits. Now I've marked where the new line is, and that's what was got, got approved. These two new lines here. The blue lines already exist. That's, key, that's Keystone 1. That is Keystone 1 right there. That line already exists. What size of pipeline is this? 36 inches. It's a big pipeline, very big. If you know space and volume and diameters, you know a 36-inch pipe pipeline is not three times as big as a 12. It grows by a proportionate number. The volume is huge. They have up to, the biggest pipeline I've ever heard of was a 56. I have never seen one. I have seen a 48 and worked on a 48 once. But 36 is a very large pipeline. It's under uh, high pressure, and uh, it's steel, steel-coated. And it's buried pit about three feet underground for urban settings, and that's anywhere where there's residences, commercial or industry, and four feet or deeper for agricultural settings. And it's a crude oil, and this is something to really grasp to. What is the crude oil? This is beyond crude. This is called a tar sands crude oil, also known as a heavy crude. And because of that, it has a very heavy consistency. And that actually starts working into the argument of environmental because you have to add what's called dilbit to this. So what is dilbit? Well, if you look at it, it's a dilutant that is put into the heavy tar sands. The tar sands themselves, in order for it to flow, they have two options. They can dilute it or they can heat it. Well, which one is the cheaper? You dilute it, okay. And, but you have to dilute, dilute it with a hydrocarbon because a hydrocarbon can't be diluted without one. You don't put water in there, it doesn't make sense. 
So you have to thin it out, if you will. Think of thick paint, and you used a thinner to thin it out. Kind of the same idea. Now, this dill bit is, um, let me see here. Let me get to, dill bit is, uh, it's a toxic substance. And typically, this is extracted from the refinery when it gets there, and it's usually piped back. So this, however, this project, it's not being piped back. That's a pretty high cost, another 1,700 miles going back the other direction. And of course, you have to expend energy to do this, and you have to pipe it. However, the smaller lines that you see around, and we have these lines in Wisconsin. We have them in Michigan. These have double pipes, the one with the actual oil, and then the dilutant going back. The dilutant is the issue that you'll see uh, soon about the environmental concerns. Well, as you well know, there's a lot of controversy there's controversy against it, and some would say this is a left and a right issue, all right? And to some degree, you're correct. On the controversy side, they say the leak would contaminate the, ala, I always have trouble with this one, Agalala, I believe it is, aquifer. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And if that happens, they claim it's a catastrophe. The Keystone has already had spills. I mentioned there's a Keystone one already. In its first year of operation, it had 12 leaks. This is just about five, six years ago. That was a state-of-the-art pipe. It already had 12 leaks. They weren't huge leaks, fortunately. But the fact of the matter is, pipelines are made by human beings. Human beings aren't perfect. I've worked uh, easements for both power lines, pipelines, gas pipelines for years. And I can tell you there are a number of incidents dealing with all of these issues. They're not perfect. Of course, a pipeline, I will also say, is the safest way of transporting uh, either natural gas, liquid gas, liquid fuel, or oil compared to your alternatives. Your alternatives really right now is train or truck. So with those alternatives, a pipeline makes a lot of sense. Eminent domain is being used by a foreign country, a foreign company, another issue that the uh, opposition presents. And then they claim the promises are not true. They say they'll increase fuel prices, that the jobs that is being uh, projected are untruthful, and even if they were truthful, they're only temporary, and things of that sort. One of the big arguments, and as a matter of fact, uh, when I was preparing for this, I looked again, and in November, uh, President Obama said and twice on uh, stump speeches, he was making this point here, TransCanada is just looking for a warm water port not necessarily to invest in the United States. They're looking away for warm water port to export. Now, TransCanada has threatened that if they don't get this pipeline, they're going to build one across Canada into uh, their only other port they really have that they could get to, and that would be, um, whoops, help me out here. It's just north of Seattle. Thank you. However, there's a little problem with Vancouver. It's not a warm water port, and it also severely limits where you could transport this oil, because the Pacific is a really big ocean. Well, let's look at some of the headlines. You see the State Department estimates that there were, it would create fewer jobs and promised by the companies. That's not so unusual. Six reasons Keystone was a bad idea. That was by Fox News. Keystone would raise gas prices. That was by Huffington Post. And Keystone pipeline may threaten um, the aquifer. And that aquifer, by the way, we're talking about in a few minutes, it is massive. It is huge, and it supplies uh, fresh water to a number of states. So let's look at those who are for it. Well, of course, their argument's going to be the opposite. They say it's the safest pipeline ever built. Well, that would probably be true because it's the newest one. It's a state of the art, and there's tremendous controversy, and everybody's watching this pipeline. And TransCanada, understand, pipeline companies don't build pipelines to fail. That costs a lot of money. They put a lot of money and engineer and safety and everything else you can imagine into a pipeline to make it as safe as possible. They do not want spills. They do not want failures. They claim it's no threat to the environment. Uh, unfortunately, though, if you go back to the history of pipelines, natural gas, and oil, you will see that there have been a number of uh, fractures and incidents and reports of them in the past, even the new pipelines. TransCanada is also a U.S. company. They claim that's true because they have a branch in the U.S. Well, the legal department can deal with that question. 
They claim they're bringing jobs. TransCanada claimed 20,000 construction jobs, 119,000 related to it. And it's going to benefit the economy, where pipelines are going to be made in the U.S. and refineries uh, will be utilized in the U.S. And they claim it will make the U.S. energy uh, uh, independent. Headlines. Keystone approval is critical for America's energy future. Approving Keystone Pipeline will create jobs. Job creating win. And TransCanada la uh, loads Nebraska Keystone XL report. You can kind of see how the argument's squaring up, can't you? Economic on one side, and the other side, environmental. That's what we've heard so far. Well, let's look at some of these facts. What about that <laughs> Agalala Aquifer? Well, it's one of the world's largest. As a matter of fact, I think there's one bigger. I believe it's in Eurasia. Uh, but we have one of the largest in the world. Look at this. This aquifer covers from South Dakota to Texas, as wide as New Mexico and Oklahoma. If you look at this entire area, 174,000 square miles, eight states. That supplies 82%, get that, 82% of the fresh drinking water for those states. Now, if oil gets in it, it's not that big of a catastrophe because oil and water don't mix. They either sink or it goes to the top. In this case, tar sands would sink like a rock. Uh, but in either case, they don't really mix. But if you put a dilutant in there, and this is a hydrocarbon dilutant, which also mixes with water, unfortunately. If that gets into the aquifer, now you have a potential catastrophe on your hands. And we're not talking of a few gallons. We're talking hundreds of thousands. And that is really could be a massive catastrophe. I thought this was fascinating. It's a few feet deep to over 1,000 feet deep underground. Isn't that amazing? I'll also tell you that this aquifer right at this point is only at about 50% of its full capacity. It has been downgrading on a regular basis for years but it has a lot of water still in it. 65% of it is located in Nebraska, and that's one reason Nebraska was this, really the center and the focus of the big argument. So get this jobs argument, the increased jobs argument. Well, the Labor Department says 42,000 jobs. The pipeline company says 119,000 jobs. The interesting thing is that um, the real numbers, when you crank these numbers down and you, you redefine them, come to three to 6,000 full-time uh, pipeline jobs, which are extremely well-paying. I mean, the welders on these pipelines, I worked some North Dakota uh, eminent domain stuff. Those welders up there start at 50, 60 bucks an hour up to $100 an hour, plus overtime, and they all work 20 to 30 hours overtime a week. That's a lot of money, okay? However, with all that time, I can also tell you on these projects, the guys are so dog tired at the end of the day, they basically eat and sleep and wake up the next morning, fill their trucks, and go right back to work. Okay. When they get their time off, which typically they get three to five days off, they'll work like two weeks solid, they get three to five days off, they go home. Most of these guys are from Louisiana, Wyoming, Texas, places like this, and they travel these pipelines. So they're not locals. But... They are right, three, 6,000 extremely high paying jobs, plus the engineers and everyone else who gets into that scene for about two years. Then these guys will go to a different project someplace or they'll be unemployed for a while. They are right that something like this brings in a lot of side jobs, approximately 40 to 42,000 side jobs, both full and part time. But if you know how pipelines are built, they're built from one side to another. The jobs and the side jobs go with it. So if you're starting in North Dakota, you're ending up in Nebraska, those jobs are going to go down that line. They're not staying at one location. So they are spread out for a while. But it is true, a pipeline this, like this does produce a lot of jobs on the interim for about two years, possibly three. And then they all go away. And what's left is the maintenance jobs, which is approximately anywhere from 50 to 200 left in the United States, and what's in the actual refineries themselves. Now, the refineries that these are going to are refineries that right now are underutilized. Some state-of-the-art refineries specifically built for crude, they're underutilized. So that is going to bring up more employment for them, plus you have export, 
transportation, things of this sort. So there are going to be some permanent jobs uh, coming out of this, but certainly not in the category of 42,000. And that's part of the counter argument on the other side. They're temporary once they're gone. The indirect jobs are also gone. It's sort of like this wave that goes through an area. That's true of all utility line construction. Pipeline demand is rising. If you look, the energy consumption in the United States is expected to increase 21% uh, by 2035. That's only 22, well, actually, it's not 22 years. This is <laughs> 21 or 20 years from now, 20 years. That's only 20 years from now. That's a big increase. And when you have that increase, you really, I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to produce the energy needs? Coal plants? Coal plants are closing. In the next 10 years, most of the coal plants are closing. So what are they being replaced with? The energy need is still there. Natural gas is coming in, heavy to replace those. Nuclear, nuclear could be the answer, but it takes a long time to build a nuclear plant. It takes a long time to get it permitted and processed. That is not an instant cure. Major uh, you know, coal, coal plant again, is, is being basically removed from our energy picture. As a matter of fact, when I was in Wyoming, I can tell you most of those coal trains are heading west. And that's not to California. It's west of the ports in Portland and the rest going across the seas to uh, Asia. We have a drive for independence. We want independence. We, you know, that's part of our national security. So there's this independence, this energy independence argument that's working into this equation. Gas fracking is also something that we've been doing. Problem with gas fracking, it's expensive. What's happened to the fuel prices? They've gone from over $100 a barrel. I think today I just heard it was $50.70 or something a barrel. That's a 50% decrease in less than six months. Think about that if you're running a business. By the way, something as a side note that people haven't talked about is the, uh, the grain prices as well. They've actually experienced a similar decrease in the last uh, two years. Let's look at the pipelines across the United States. Here's a picture. The blue ones are the interstate and the red ones are the intrastate. You can see that we are well covered in this country with pipelines. So kind of brings up a question, and I just named a few. These are the major states, Texas, Louisiana, and Ohio, and Pennsylvania are the biggest states. There's competition with the XL. You might not have heard about this. There's a lot of competition. As a matter of fact, there's at least half a dozen pipelines proposed right now that would do a similar job that XL would do, but they're all within the United States, produced by the United States Energy. This is one of them right here. Um, this one here is coming from the Chicago area, Flanagan. There's a big plant there coming down and going to Freeport as well. There's others. So I only want to mention that because there is competition. There's also a lot of tar sand proposals coming along the line here. The big uh, stars you see, that's the tar sand areas. And these are the ones that they need to somehow get that energy to here to a port or there to a port so they can export if they want to and at least have that availability. So there's a lot more tar sands out there than what we've heard just recently. And more pipelines are coming, uh, both gas, natural gas, and oil, as I've mentioned before. I have just some stats right here that 31,900 miles of pipelines are planned for North America. Now, this is a mix between natural gas, oil, and uh, fuel oil. That's a lot. So there is a lot of competition. But here's some of the questions. Let's look at another fact. Will the Keystone XL benefit our energy independence? Well, I think that answer would be absolutely yes if there's an absolute guarantee that that oil is coming to the United States for us to use. Little problem with that. That's not in the cards. What the Senate agreed to, what the House agreed to, does not make the United States the primary user. We don't have first dibs. TransCanada early in said that's not happening. They will make no such agreement. But, but, 30% right now of the oil refined in the Gulf is exported outside the United States. Why would that be exported if we want independence in our country? It's called the market. Whoever pays the most 
gets the oil. They say and they claim that even with that, even if we accept the fact that most of this oil is going to be shipped out, uh, we could somewhat say at the same token that about half would stay in the United States. But there are no guarantees on this. TransCanada has made no such agreement. The bill does not require it. TransCanada has made it absolutely and crystal clear. Their objective is a warm water port, period. That's their objective. They made that clear in their own um, uh, proposal within TransCanada as well as publicly. They are not really hiding this fact. Um, and like I pointed out, there's a lot more oil and natural gas projects right now in the United States that could be competitors and soon. So how does this all work into eminent domain? Well, there's a little thing in eminent domain of the Fifth Amendment called the Takings Clause. And there's actually a related amendment that deals with states' rights. But this is the foundation of eminent domain, property rights. As a matter of fact, there's often our um, scholars in the Constitution have said this, this right, the Fifth Amendment, particularly the Takings Clause, known as the Property Right Clause, that that is the, um, they called it, that is the right of all rights. It is the foundation of all rights. And this actually, it's got a, Edmund of Maine has a fascinating history to it. Uh, for those who are biblical scholars, you can find it right away in the Old Testament. There's a uh, case of eminent domain in the Old Testament. I don't know if you remember the story, but uh, King Ahab wanted a garden. He really liked this guy's garden. And instead of just taking the garden, he went to him and he offered just compensation for the garden. With the threat, if you don't give it to me, I'm taking you. Um, that's the very first case of eminent domain. So here is our Fifth Amendment. And I've, highlight, or I've highlighted the takings clause says, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use, that's its condition, without just compensation. That's the other condition. There are basically two foundational conditions of eminent domain. It must be for the greater good of the public, and it must have just compensation come with it. I can tell you for over 200 years we've been debating both issues. What's the greater good of the public and what's just compensation? Um, and there's a lot of law that goes into it. I am an appraiser, not an attorney. But my specialty is eminent domain. And as that specialty, I have to know the elements of how the courts have ruled, what is just compensation, different valuation techniques that they have said works and doesn't work and things of that sort. So I can represent my value as strong as possible uh, and to defend it. That's part of what a forensic appraiser does. They're actually experts um, that develop reports and then present orally. So let's look at public benefit, that first issue. It has to be to the greater good of the public. Let's look at the XL line. Energy independence, do we have it? Is that a guarantee on this line? They haven't guaranteed it. More jobs? Yes, more jobs. Okay. But well, we can come back to that and say, at what price? It's our Constitution we're dealing with, and should economics overrule the Constitution? Environmental damage. There's a potential, as I mentioned to you before, uh, if you call them the left, the left, the, the tree huggers, whatever you want to call them, they have a very, very good point which one cannot ignore, and that is, if that pipeline dilutant gets into that water system, we have a natural disaster on our hands that we have never seen before, and we have no plan on how to fix it. That's a real problem, okay? Um, being able to export in energy, is that a public benefit, that we can export energy? How does that benefit the public, other than maybe jobs? So there's some questions there. Do these benefits outweigh the right that we set forth in our Constitution about property rights? We have basically two entities that have the right to eminent domain. One is a government entity, and that comes back to the very foundation of government, comes back to the King George and why we rebelled against him and all of this stuff. Again, there's a lot of fascinating history behind what, what predated our Fifth Amendment. We said the government has the right. 
because the government represents the best interests of the public. So the government does have this right innately. It doesn't have to be given by the court. And this is every level of government. However, what about private entities? We have power lines that are being built every day. Those are not being built by the government. Those are being built by private, for-profit companies. Well, what about the telegraph? What about the railroad? This argument has gone all the way back there. How are you ever going to build a railroad which you have to go from point A to point B in a straight line if you have to deal with all the individual people and they can say yes or no? That's going to be a very odd-looking railroad by the time. Uh, years and years ago, the government and Supreme Court of our nation decided that the railroad has the right of eminent domain, even though it was a private for-profit corporation, because they saw the railroad linking the country, and that's for the greater good of the public. Same thing with the telegraph, same thing eventually with the telephone and power lines and pipelines. But what about private and foreign industry? This is, a, this is not necessarily new territory, but to the extent and the size, as we're saying today, it's new territory. I say it's not new territory because I have uh, worked on some projects where we are going across the border to Canada. Um, usually we're sending stuff to them. <laughs> power lines in Montana, they were sending the energy to there. But that power line was actually owned by a Canadian company, um, and it was really to their benefit. So how did that ever work in us? Well, we were generating the power. The United States was generating the power. We were selling them the excess. We we're getting taxes off this and lots of other issues. And so they made the argument and they won the argument that we had the right to uh, use eminent domain, even to supply a foreign entity. Well, think about other foreign entities that are right around the United States. Well, there aren't many. One is Mexico. So if Mexico had something that they wanted to bring into the United States uh, and bring to one of our ports that might increase jobs, would this be a, a good argument for them to have the right of eminent domain? Or was the ar argument for eminent domain in our founding fathers focused mainly in the area of American citizenry or the uniqueness of our country and our constitution? There are two big questions that sit in front of anybody who's dealing with the Keystone XL. Does it meet the test of for the greater good of public? That is a real, very, you know, and I, and I agree with the speaker earlier. This argument has not seen the light of day at all. I've, I've checked the House. I've checked the Senate. This argument has not really been foremost and up front. It's all been about environment on one side, economics on the other. And I propose to you, should we sacrifice either for our Constitution? That's the question in front of each one of you. And then should Keystone XL and TransCanada have the right of eminent domain, i.e., should a foreign entity have the right to use the U.S. Constitution to their benefit, to what looks like or may be benefit to the public? Eminent domain is a really interesting subject field, and it's one of the foundations of our country. Think about it. Why... Do you have such security here? Can the sheriff take your property right now without due cost? No. Matter of fact, chances are they can't even come on your property. Can a president just decide to take your property for any reason? No, he cannot. Can a governor, can a mayor, can a senator? No, they do not have that power to do that. It gives an amazing sense of security to the property owners. And owning property is one of the foundations of any democracy. So this whole issue and this right of eminent domain weaves a very interesting web. And I present to you that the Keystone has a challenge in front of each one of us, if we're conservative, if we're constitutionists, or what have you, to really try to come to a balance to decide, is this really a good idea? Are our senators and congressmen and our president on board? or off board? Are they focusing right on the primary issues? The question also gets a little larger because you mentioned, uh, key, Kilo was mentioned before, that's K-E-L-O. Kilo is, uh, Miss Kilo is a nice little lady who's unfortunately lost her house and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And her situation was she said no to um, the, uh, uh, 
a government entity at that time to take her property. And what they're doing is they're doing what they called urban renewal. It's called blight sometimes. And they were taking the whole blocks and blocks of this, uh, of this neighborhood because a chemical company was coming in and they were promising all these jobs, 800 jobs, and, but they wanted all this nice park, this new facility, all these support structures. And so they were presenting that to the city and the city of New London said, hey, this is a great idea. We're depressed. We don't have many jobs. These chemical jobs coming in are very high paying. This would be great. It'd be a boon for everything. And they define good, greater good of the public as economic. And the challenge came, and Ms. Ke uh, Kilo was the only one who stood in front of it and said, no, I, uh, I beg to differ. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court overrode her and said, yes, they, uh, the municipality has that right to do that for urban renewal. As an appraiser, something happened to us, at least the guys who are in property rights and really are sensitive to this. And here's the issue that we were looking at. There's a thing in appraisal called highest and best use, all right? It's the first measurement you make on a property once you've inspected it and you look at all its potential legal uses or potential future uses. Then you value the property according to its highest and best use. What the Supreme Court was really saying, with maybe not even understanding that they really said this, was if your property is not used in the highest and best use, in our view, we have the right to take it. That's what they're saying. That's troubling. That's very troubling. I can tell you... Just a very funny little uh, uh, story right on the heels of Kilo. Kilo was just decided now. Three months later, I was involved in eminent domain issue, which was very complicated, and it was in Green Bay. <laughs> and Green Bay uh, attorneys, uh, municipal attorneys, came and started arguing Kilo. And it was interesting because the judge right then, an old, old crotchety guy, and he took his gavel and just hammered it down, and he says, don't you talk to Kilo about me in my court. There will be no Kilo here, bam. And I was like, whoa, okay. He just said he's not following the U.S. Supreme Court. That's interesting. Um, and they, I mean, to settle. the thing was settled actually uh, out of court at the end. But it was interesting how much emotion Kilo had brought out. Few people knew about eminent domain until the Kilo decision. And it just seemed to rub both liberals and conservatives wrong on this one. Why should someone, entity in the government, have the right to take your property simply because it's not being used the way they think it should and they have a better idea? Well, Keystone has some of those elements to it, if you saw. It has the elements of the jobs. It has the elements of promises being made and uh, how this could benefit the country, maybe, and things of this sort. The long story of Kilo is... Uh, Chemical company never built. They're gone. And they now have this nice cleared area of the city in New Bedford with nothing and more depressed than ever before. Um, there's no guarantee that that will go forward either. So that's the story with Kilo. Um, and the whole issue of eminent domain and to be hypersensitive to our property rights and to really, in my book, I, I would stand on the property rights before anything else, but that is my prejudice and my, uh, my slant. All right, we've got about 10 minutes. Anyone want to throw some questions at me? I'd be happy to address them. Yes? I know you said in the beginning that the oil was crunched under high pressure. What kind of devices are used to create that pressure, and uh, how many are there? How many devices? Uh, I can't tell you that exact number. I can tell you natural gas pipelines, I think they're about five miles away from each other, the valves, uh, which packs a lot of volume in between. Uh, but with the heavier, I'm not sure about that, but they'd use pumps, uh, obviously, to increase the pressure to flow the, uh, the fluid through. And a high-pressure pipeline, by the way, the, just one thing, if... It leaks at its weakest point, it's, it, as you can well imagine. Um, and the engineering that goes behind these is, is very impressive. And the engineering of the uh, welds on the joints is incredibly impressive. And they use a lot of high tech and skill to try to make sure nothing is wrong. But even with that, you can imagine that there are some issues. And basically what happens with a pipeline on high pressure is if, it, if their weakness develops someplace, it's a lot like a, um, um, like a hernia. 
Okay, the pressure starts pushing more and more on the weak point. That weak point starts weakening and starts, you know, bulbing up, and eventually it will break. And this is how natural gas pipelines actually explode when there's no, uh, uh, what do you call that, um, no igniter present. Is you take all that pressure and, high, and gas pipelines can be 11, 1,200 pounds of uh, pressure. You put all that through a very tiny little hole. The steel heats up very fast, red hot, very quickly, and that becomes your igniter. And that's where you have the ignition of several pipelines who are in the country where no one's even around it. What happened? And that's, that's why they're very careful how they put the pipeline in, too. Um, yeah, another pipeline question. Sorry, not that much. I'd be, I'm curious about what is the speed that that oil flows like per miles per hour, right. and how many barrels would that pump out per minute? That's out of my domain. <laughs> that I don't know. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. If you saw that picture before, right? Right. And there's a Keystone One, and. It's interesting how that argument you don't hear much of either. Come on, move it, move it, move it. Let's go, let's go. And uh, here we go, it's coming. <laughs> oh boy, it's way in the front, I guess. I was wondering who was going to pick that up. That's an excellent question. And that's one I would present to our senators and our congressmen. Um, Let's, for instance, accept the argument and the economic argument. And let's also maybe, if you notice here, it does go through the aquifer, though. It does already, Keystone 1. It's just right here. But here's, here's the big concern. And this part of Nebraska holds 82% of all the water. And from what I've been told, right here in the center is where all the deep, the 1,000 feet is. Um, so that is a good question. Why doesn't it go like this or just divert it? Well, you know your basic geometry, right? What's the shortest distance between two points? Straight line. It's, it becomes very economically expensive to move it and create corners. Uh, in pipelines, corners are very expensive. We've been involved in finding some errors uh, as appraisers and suggesting back to the pipeline, uh, you know, maybe you should maybe turn it this way, and they've told us how much uh, just one turn costs. And it's, it's an amazing amount of, num uh, amount of money to put one elbow in. But, yes? Do you have any update on the Appleton Library project? <laughs> I do not. I am sorry. <laughs> that I do not have. <laughs> I haven't been called yet. Let's put it that way. Yes? Yes. This area here, um, right through here, is called the Sands in the Sand Hills area. Um, it's not really high productive land. Uh, it's very nice recreational land. There's a lot of excellent hunting out there. But as far as your high end prairie or high end uh, egg land, it's really not that. Whereas you start getting the Dakotas, you get up in this area here, particularly South Dakota uh, and parts of Iowa, you can be talking $10,000 an acre egg land or up to 12. We just finished one in Illinois. We're at 12,000 an acre. Is, that is, gets expensive. Is the Keystone also owned by Transcendent? Yes. So they, I mean, I guess they, they right. can't be used similar land. Parallel. They can, and that has been done in the past. Enbridge comes through, the, through Wisconsin, um, and Enbridge did just that. They used their existing pipeline and, and, and ponied up another easement right next to it and ran them side by side. Yes. Uh, just an opinion, not necessarily a fact. I think that oil will be moved uh, one way or another because of worldwide demand. Mm -hmm. But if that's a given, um, what, in your opinion, what's wrong with continuing to move that oil by rail? Oh, uh, rail, first off, is it's very expensive. Yeah, hundred percent safe. But correct. If there's a leak, it's on the surface, and they can get to it. Well, that part is true. Uh, you do expend a lot of energy to move it. That's another issue. Um, the energy you're expending on a pipeline is greatly reduced compared to a locomotive. 
and the danger to the general public is greatly reduced compared to running it on rail. Uh, you, you know, rail accidents happen. They just do. Again, nothing is perfect. Things are going to go wrong. When they do, they can get really ugly on a rail. But on the side of that, if you puncture a big pipeline, you know, by the time they turn the valves down, you have yourself a massive leak on your hands that a rail would not have uh, because you have all the individual compartments. But from what I've read is that the cost is extremely expensive. And it's really digging into the whole profitability of why would we even do that. North Dakota is doing it right now, uh, mainly because they have no other way of getting it out. But uh, they're also putting pipelines in, but that's a whole different issue. Yes? How many years is that pipeline viable? Well, that's a really good question. Um, at least 50, without, supposedly without problems. I mean, we've got pipelines sitting in here in uh, even in this county that are 1920s, 1930s, that have not been updated. And that was with old technology, under not under that pressure. It won't erode the inside of that pipeline? No, pressure doesn't erode it. Actually, it's a nice lubricant, if you will. Uh, what can erode is the, dilu uh, the dilutant in there. But really, where the pipeline's major issue is, is the acidity of the soils around it that will ne react negatively with the pipeline itself. Yes. Yes. I'm, have you ever heard of the Institute for Justice? Yes, I'm part of them. I'm, you're part of it. Yes. Um, I received something in the mail which I found interesting, and of course, through this meeting, I said I'd bring it because it deals that institute with these issues a great deal. Am I correct? And then, secondly, yes. um, what is your view of this organization for those who would like to have an organization to? You know, keep them informed and sure. one thing or another. They're an excellent organization, very balanced, uh, in my view, um, and very committed. Now, um, yeah, I support them. I'm, you know, I get their, their magazine on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Emmett Domain Conference tomorrow in San Francisco. This is a national conference. It's actually not for appraisers. It's for attorneys. I'm one of four appraisers, I think, that actually goes to this out of, 300 some people that are there, uh, but they're there. Uh, the IJ is there at that, in, that uh, conference as well, and they deal a lot in eminent domain matters. Uh, their focus, they do property eminent domain, but their focus is also property rights such as job opportunities, taking licenses, license issues, uh, things of that sort, and they're very, very involved. So they're a great organization. I would always, I would highly recommend them. Yes. Uh, Many of us were involved, uh, yeah, some of us involved here with what was called the Wisconsin Heritage Parkway not too many years back. Okay. And it sort of got pushed off to the side, and it's uh, basically been replaced with the uh, Wisconsin Heritage Water Trail. So they diminished the amount of taking on each side of the rivers, but there's still roughly about a mile, as I understand it, each side of the rivers that are now under federal control. Only the problem being, I think for many, is that we have yet to see what that means. Hmm. So what I'm getting at here is, as this unfolds, um, how does one deal with, could be the DNR, could be EPA, could be the county, I suppose, whatever, in, in the taking area? I mean, what, sure. What do we do? Uh, well, there, there's another issue of takings in eminent domain called uh, inverse condemnation. Uh, inverse condemnation is a taking of your property without compensation. Instead of without just compensation, it's without compensation. Um, that is a potential avenue uh, when there isn't a direct taking of a property. But I can tell you, I'll warn you right off, indirect is a very um, chancy uh, methodology and not very successful for most cases. But Why? Why is that? you have to prove, first off, there, that there is a taking and there's lots of issues that come into police powers, regulatory powers, these other issues as well. And it becomes difficult to prove. But if you prove it, um, then a wonderful thing happens because once, uh, uh, in, once um, inverse condemnation happens is then the condom nor ends up having to pay for absolutely everything that you ever incurred, win or lose. So it gets real expensive for them at that point. So that's when settlements happen. Yes? You know, you mentioned when you started to get something about that the Trans-Canadian Company would only allow Native United States 
say we have 20 or 30 percent of the oil or whatever used for our use and all the other gets exported, we could make a deal with them and say maybe 50 percent we should be able to keep. <laughs> well, they yeah, they made no deal whatsoever. Water. They said no deal whatsoever. They're not promising a thing. Um, yeah, we could have done that as a condition. All right, we got to stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you.